we are going to uh, do something that I said when we began our study in Luke. I said that we were kind of taking a telescopic look at the book. We, rather than focusing in on uh, word by word, looking at each verse, we uh, have spent much of the time going through this book, kind of backing up and getting a broad view. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to cover a whole chapter today. All right? So. Several of you be in prayer right now, okay? Uh, we're going to look at this whole chapter, 35 verses, 35 verses. But first of all, I want you to look at this, this picture up here. I, I saw this picture and I thought, wow, that looks nice. <laughs> How many of you woke up around be between 4 and 4.30 this morning? Boom! Uh, God was letting us know that he was sending us rain. How many of you have been praying for rain? I've been praying for rain, and we need to continue to do that. But understand that every blessing in life is from the Lord. Every good thing is from above. And uh, so we need to spend our lives in continuous thanksgiving. Not just for the physical blessings, but for the spiritual blessings. But the thing is that God, over and over in His Word, He makes it very, very clear that He created the world in such a way to draw our attention to spiritual things. Uh, there isn't a verse that says this, okay? I'm just saying to you that over and over God points at physical things saying they illustrate spiritual things. Over and over we see in Jesus' parables, he points at physical things and says they represent spiritual things. And when I stop and consider, who's the creator of all things? Now, when I use something physical to be an illustration of spiritual truth, I have to just say, I looked at this and wow, it occurred to me that this is a picture of something. But when God does that, he created it. So he created these things with that intention. When we walk out and we feel the refreshing of the rain on our face and we realize that this water is going to touch the earth and it's going to turn green and our fields can grow and food can grow and beautiful plants can grow, that's because God made it that way. And, and it's a picture of how He is the living water. Everybody remember the Bible talks about Jesus being the living water. He gives us living water. He gives us what we need for life. Well, we're going to go through this chapter, and we're going to see several things that God uses as an illustration, physical things that he created in such a way that they are an illustration of spiritual truth. But we're going to start on a negative note. How many of you have discovered in life that sometimes the truth hurts? Sometimes it's difficult to face the reality of a situation. But the reality is you can't correct a situation until you deal with it. One of the things, I mean, a growing phenomena in our culture has been the idea of, uh, now, now the word escapes me, I, I want to say confrontation, that's not the word that we we use an, an encounter, that's not the word. When a bunch of people go and, and confront somebody with a problem, what's that called? An intervention. An intervention. Why do you need interventions? Because people have a hard time facing the truth. People have a hard time facing the truth. And sometimes when a group of people love somebody and they're obviously damaging their lives, sometimes we need some intervention in our lives. Jesus is doing a little intervention in these first few verses. I've got seven points. I'm going to try to move quickly through them because I want us to see the whole flow of this passage because this chapter gives us the whole picture. How many of you noticed the title of the message? The whole picture. This is the whole picture of what God is doing in our lives. And there's seven points I want you to notice and the first one has to do with every person's condition. Every person's condition. Begin at verse 1. Now on the same occasion, there were some, pre some present who reported to him about the Galileans 
whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Okay, we know Pilate. We know him as the one who was uh, the governor of this area. He's the one that Jesus stood before, and he condemned uh, Jesus with the authority of the Roman Empire to be crucified. But here he appears. Evidently, Pilate, what, as you study the history of Pilate, he was constantly having to put down rebellions. This was a very rebellious time that Jesus lived in because there were many people coming forward and claiming to be the Messiah. They were doing that because they knew the Old Testament had set up a timetable. It was time for Messiah to show up. And there were people who were stepping forward and saying, I'm the Messiah, and they would try to lead a rebellion against Rome. And so Pilate was constantly putting down these rebellions. And so he shed a lot of blood. And in this particular situation up in Galilee, there were those that he had killed. And Jesus said to them, verse 2, Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Perish. Two different things that had happened that people were talking about, buzzing about. I mean, this tower had fallen and killed a bunch of people. We had something happen this week. A bunch of people killed. I mean, it's starting to be a regular thing. And the way that people try to use those circumstances to further their agendas is frustrating to me sometimes. But the reality is, it's heartbreaking when you hear about all kinds of people dying. And the first question, I, I'm going to just take a wild guess, and I'm going to say that some of you have had something personally happen this week. That you might have asked this question that we always ask when something goes wrong. Why does this happen to me? Anybody ever ask that question? Why did this happen to me? Because we have this idea that whenever anything bad happens, it happens as a result of something else. Now, if you speed and you get a ticket, you can draw the connections. Okay, but sometimes things just happen to us, and we have a tendency to think that something bad happens to someone because they're bad. And what is Jesus? Can I just... Can I just ask you please to pay very close attention to what Jesus says? Twice, he says, I say unto you what? No. 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 Is that why bad things happen in this world? No. Jesus says no. Do bad things happen to good people? Yes. Do bad things happen to bad people? Yes. Do good things happen to good people? Yes. Do good things happen to bad people? Good and bad things happen to people. Sometimes we do something wrong and it brings about a negative result, but sometimes we have something awful happen to us and it just happens because we live in a fallen world. I want everybody to repeat after me. We live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world. Sometimes you have to stop and instead of asking, God, why did you do this to me? Or why is this happening to me? We need to remind ourselves, we live in a fallen world. Say it again with me. We live in a fallen world. We live in a world where there's sickness and death and harm and damage and pain and sorrow and struggling. And Jesus said, in this world you'll have tribulation. I repeat that all the time, don't I? Because in a lot of churches, you are led to believe that if you just do the right thing, everything is going to be smooth and happy. Jesus didn't say that. In this world, you'll have tribulation. Jesus said, do you think these people were worse than anybody else? I tell you, no. Why is this so important? 
not only because of dealing with the difficulties of life, but let's stretch it out, let's broaden our view, like I said, let's stop and consider eternity. There's an awful lot of people that think, well, I'm a generally a very fine person, I'm a nice guy, I try to treat everybody, you know, I follow the golden rule, I follow the Ten Commandments. Like I said to you, go read the Ten Commandments. Nobody gets past number one. You shall love the Lord your God with all. I mean, no other gods before me. Excuse me, that's what Jesus said is the greatest commandment. The Ten Commandments, the first one, is you shall have no other gods before me. In other words, God will be first every moment of your life. Nobody gets past number one. Nobody gets past number one. But there's a tendency to always want to look at other people and say, well, that happened to them. They must be worse than me. We, we look at people and think bad things happen to them because they're bad, and, and we compare and we think that all these things uh, work a certain way, and Jesus uses these two circumstances to say something very simple. No, I say to you, no, it's not like that. Unless everybody repents, you will what? Perish. Perish. What's that mean? Die. Now, is he talking about physical death? No, he's not talking about physical death. Everybody's going to die anyway, right? Uh, everybody, everybody who has plans to die, put your hand up. We all plan to die. <laughs> you better plan to die. You better plan to die. Every single one of us have only a set amount of time on this earth. And that's going to come in a little bit more importantly later. He's not talking about physical death. Everybody should have, anybody with a brain knows they're going to die physically because every generation, how many of you know how many generations have died before this one? All of them. All of them. Exactly right. You don't need to give me a number. All of them. Every single generation dies. We all die. What Jesus is talking about is the spiritual death that he warns about over and over and over. And the problem is because people have, never have a tendency to think that they deserve spiritual death. And Jesus is using these two circumstances where people have a tendency to compare and say, oh, they must be worse than me that that happened to them. And Jesus is saying... Do not think like that. Everyone, and this is your first point, every person's condition. Let me just give you three words. Repent or die. Repent or die. Is that not what Jesus says in these verses? He says, I tell you, unless you repent, you will also likewise perish. Unless you repent. Every person's condition, repent or die. In other words, everyone's in the same condition. Everyone. Everyone. Could I make this point? Everyone. 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 Now, what does repent mean? Somebody knows who, what that means. What does it mean? Turn around. Turn around. Some people would say change your mind. It means to change your mind, change your direction. In other words, whatever you're trusting in, what Jesus just described, basically what did Jesus just described? Other people are worse than me. In a sense, in a sense, when you boil it down, that's what everybody's greatest hope is. There are a lot of people worse than me, so I'm going to make it into heaven. There's a lot of people worse than me. They look at these people. That wouldn't happen to them unless they were worse than me. A lot of people worse than me. We always want to compare to the people who are worse than us. And what does the Bible say is God's standard? Basically, Jesus Christ. If you're going to compare yourself to somebody, compare yourself to Jesus Christ. Because he's the standard. But everybody wants to compare themselves to someone that they consider worse than them. And Jesus says, I say to you, no, everyone needs to repent. Everyone needs to turn from their sin. Everyone needs to turn from whatever they're trusting in and turn to him. Turn to Jesus. Turn to Jesus. Well, let's read the next few verses because here's man's condition. Everybody needs to repent or die. And 
What is God doing in this circumstance where all of mankind is in this terrible situation where they're on their way to spiritual death? In fact, they already exist in spiritual death. The Bible says that each of us is born with sin. The scripture says the wages of sin, excuse me, uh, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is what? But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We know that repentance leads to faith, faith to salvation. And so what is God doing during this time? Look at these next verses. It sounds a little odd, but I want you to think about it. And he be began telling them a parable. He began telling them a parable. I want you to understand, this is flowing thought. He just told them, everybody, repent or die. That's everybody's condition. And based on that, flowing out of that, he began telling them this parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, excuse me, vineyard keeper, behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. And then he goes on to something else. And you read that and, and it seems like, that's kind of weird, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's almost random, you know? I mean, Jesus starts talking about fig trees. But can I just ask you, what does it mean? What is the basic principle of that little story? Fig tree for three years doesn't produce any fruit. And the owner, he has a perfect right to say, cut that thing down. It's useless. What did we just say? Every person's condition, repent or die. Now, can I just ask you, who's, who's the owner of the fig tree here? If you tie it into what we just read, if, you, if, if it makes sense at all, which it does, by the way, it seems a little random. But the thing is, here's every man's condition. Repent or die. Repent or die. And basically, it's telling us there's only a certain amount of time. You've got to make that decision. Repent or die. And what is this little parable about? It's about giving more time. I want you to stop and think for just a second. What is God doing today? <coughs> He's giving us more time. He's giving us more time. Now, I just said, we all have a limited amount of time. How much more time do we have? Nobody knows. Not a one of you know. But here's what God is doing. He is giving us more time. More time for what? Well, more time to be saved if we're not saved. If you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, listen to me. If you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, God is giving you time to do that right now. But let's stop and think about this, Christian. He uses a parable here about bearing fruit. Generally, when the Bible talks about bearing fruit, is he talking about the saved or the unsaved? He's usually talking about the saved. If you're a Christian here today, what is God doing for you? He's giving you more time. He's giving you more time. He's given me another day. He's giving you another day. To do what? Well, look at the parable. Bear to bear fruit. Now, there's, there's a connection here. The first statement, Jesus says, I say no. You know, everybody, repent or die. We understand that the, the results of that decision are going to happen when we stand before God in judgment. And in a sense, this little parable, in a very clear sense, is a picture of judgment. The owner of the vineyard, the one that gave it life, the one who we're responsible to, we stand before him. And he will judge our lives. And frankly, what does he see? When he comes and he judges our lives, what does he see? Now, the thing is, I'm not standing here telling you 
this because I think you need to straighten up your life. I'm telling you this because I know that I stand before God. Every one of us does. And as I ask the question, what fruit does he find in my life? I know that I'm lacking. I know there's areas in which I'm lacking. And what is God doing? Now, some people would say, well, this, this, this worker, that represents Jesus. I, I'm not going to try to assign every different thing to you. I'm just saying the point of this parable is that God is giving us more time. While we are in need of repentance, or else there's death. And by the way, if you think that only applies to the lost, read the book, read the 8th chapter of Romans. Paul talks to Christians and he tells them, you better be living in the spirit because if you're living in the flesh, that produces what? Every Christian should know this. Every Christian should know this. If you're living in the flesh, what does it produce? Death. Everybody say death. 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 Living in the flesh produces death. You may be a Christian and you may be on your way to heaven, but if we're living in the flesh, we're producing death. That's not what we ought to be doing. We're not bearing fruit. We're not producing life if we're not living in the Spirit. And the Bible warns us. God is giving us more time right now. What are you doing with your time? In fact, Paul even says in the book of Romans, excuse me, this is in Ephesians, in Ephesians 5, he says to redeem the time. Redeem the time. You and I, our time can either produce life or it can produce death. So we need to be careful what, how we're living. God today is giving us more time. That's what he's doing all the time. Read the book of 1 Peter. People will say, where is the sign that's coming? You know, Jesus said this stuff about coming back. Where is he? You know, where is he? And Peter says, God isn't, he hasn't lost interest in the world. He's, he's not distracted. He's giving us more time. He doesn't desire for any to perish. He's giving us more time. So every person's condition is repent or die. And what is God doing in this situation? He's giving us more time. More time to do what? Repent so that there's life. To walk in the Spirit. To put our faith in Christ. Time to be saved. Time to bear fruit for the kingdom of God. But I want you to move on through the passage with me. Because if we are to produce fruit for God, how are we to do that? What, what method? How, how do we go about this? We obviously need to go about it God's way. And I want to ask you, what is God's way? It's revealed here in the next verses. He was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, verse 10. And there was a woman who for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit. And she was bent over double and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are free from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. And the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, There are six days in which to work should, excuse me, there are six days in which work should be done. So come during those days and get healed, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham, as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? And he said this, as he said this, all his opponents were being humiliated, and the entire crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by him. You might say, Pastor, that should be another sermon. I mean, Jesus was always talking to these guys, these religious guys, about the Sabbath day and the meaning of the Sabbath. I mean, that's, that is a huge thing because there's a lot of arguments that go on about what the Sabbath day means. And, and there's many people who feel like the Sabbath day is one of those things that needs to be carried over from the Old Testament. Can I just say to you, Jesus is our Sabbath? 
If you want to understand the New Testament, Jesus is our Sabbath. In him we find rest. Should we not rest at least one day out of the week? I think, yes, we ought to do that. Should we not set aside a day to worship the Lord? Isn't Sunday the Lord's day? Well, they called it that. But can I just tell you, there is not a particular command in the New Testament about which day we're supposed to worship Him. Here's the command, worship Him every day. Amen. Worship Him every day. But the Sabbath that we are to keep is that we are to rest in Christ. He is the only way that we can have rest from our sin, rest from our labors, rest knowing that we are secure. And as we look at this, as we consider every person's condition, repent or die, what is God's doing? He's, he's giving us more time to repent. Well, if we're to repent and if we're to go God's way, what is God's way? God's way is the way of healing and freedom. Healing and freedom. And I want to say this to you because Jesus is standing in stark contrast to the religious people of his day. Jesus was all about healing and freedom. And they were all about rules and indignation. Rules and indignation. And I just want to say to you, Christian, listen to me. We have got to be on guard because it is very easy to be religious folks. It is very easy to be religious folks. I've been about around plenty of Christians that immediately they want to tell you about the rules people are breaking and act indignant about it. That's very religious. That's what religious people do. Well, they don't do this and such and such. I've met pastors that you could not bring up a, a person's name. Within five minutes, they had given you their judgments of this person about all the areas that they fall short. Frankly, it makes me uncomfortable to be around people like that. Guess how it makes people that need to know Jesus feel? We need to be cautious because it is very, very easy to become religious. Sin makes us sick and bound. Sin makes a person a sick person and a prisoner. Religion causes you to look at people and say, they're sick. They're just prisoners. Jesus causes us to try to set people free. Jesus causes us to try to make people well. Not to be indignant about their sickness or their boundness, but rather to make them well. To set them free. What did Jesus say? If you continue in my words, you will know the what? You will know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Set you free. And yet, we oftentimes want to focus on people's boundness rather than to share with them what will set them free. And Jesus was about healing and freedom. Healing and freedom. That's why one of the things that I warn you about and I've seen in the church, the greatest problem in the church of Jesus Christ is not heresy. It's not even immorality. In, at least in Southern Baptist churches, okay? I'm a Southern Baptist pastor. I've never spent much time in any other denomination. But the major problem in Southern Baptist churches is one Christian wanting to impose their rules on another Christian. And when you won't do what I want you to do, I get mad at you and start being indignant with you and telling other people about it. Now, has ever, anybody ever seen that kind of thing happen? That's what religion does to you. But what Jesus does to you is causes you to live in his freedom and causes you to want other people to live in his freedom. Every person's condition, repent or die. God, what is God doing? As man is in this condition, he is giving us more time 
to repent and go His way. What is God's way? It is the way of healing and freedom. I want you to move on to verse 18. So he was saying, What is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and threw into his own garden, and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. And he said, To what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid it three pecks hid it in three packs of flour until it was all leavened. Now, I want two things I want you to consider. Number one, this is still a flow of thought. We're talking about man's condition, repent or die. What is God doing? He's giving us more time to repent. If we repent and go God's way, it is the way of healing and freedom. And if we will live in God's way, what will be the result? What will be the kingdom of God? And he says it will be like a mustard seed and leaven. What in the world do mustard seeds and leaven have in common? Jesus is really confused in these situations. I mean, he, he brings up all these pictures of things totally unrelated. Mustard seed and leaven. What do they have in common? They get bigger. They grow. They get bigger. They spread. He's saying the kingdom of heaven is intended to spread. But how do mustard seeds and leaven, what do they have in common about how they spread, how they grow? They're two totally different things. A little mustard seed, you stick it in the ground and it causes a plant to grow. Can I just ask you this though? Does the plant grow from one spot or does it pop up everywhere? It grows up from one spot. Now maybe as it drops seeds later on you might get little volunteers, but the thing is, in order for that mustard seed Something over here isn't going to grow because of what the mustard seed is doing. It's got to be connected to the seed. It's got to be in intimate contact. What about leaven? What about leaven? You put a little bit of leaven in the loaf and it causes the whole loaf to expand, but only as that leaven touches different parts of the dough and it spreads in such a way. The two things that that Jesus uses have one thing in common is that they spread because of connection. And they spread because of intimate contact. They spread because the initial investment, the little mustard seed or the little leaven, touches something else. I want to share with you what this picture is. This picture is exactly the same picture that Jesus gave us when the 5,000 were fed. Do you remember that story? We talked about going back and forth. Why? Because the people had to go to Jesus to get the food. They had to go to the, the people to feed them. What we have is on one hand touching Jesus, on the other hand touching people, and that's the way it's intended to grow. If you don't connect to Jesus, what do you have to offer? Nothing. But if you're touching Jesus and don't touch people, what are you doing? You're keeping it to yourself. And the, the, the kingdom of heaven is intended to grow. The kingdom of heaven, and when we experience the freedom and the healing that Christ has given you, He wants you to reach out and touch other people with that freedom and that healing. It's intended that God's kingdom will grow. What is man's condition? Repent or die. What is God doing? He's giving us time to repent. If we repent and go God's way, what is that going to look like? It's going to look like healing and freedom. And how does it grow and spread to other people? Through connection. Connected to Christ. Connected to people. Loving Jesus. Loving people. Did Jesus say something about that? What's the greatest commandment? Love God. Love people. The way the kingdom grows through connection. But there's a warning. There's a warning here. There is, well, let's read it, verses 22 to 30. Excuse me, I jumped over some verses. It helps if you look at the right chapter. <laughs> I was looking at the wrong page. 
And he was passing, verse 22, he was passing through from one city and village to another teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, open up to us. Then he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you came from. Depart from me. Are you all you evildoers? In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but yourselves being thrown out. And they will come from east and west and from north and south and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first and some are first who will be last. Now let me just set the context real quick. This is something that Jesus was saying to Israel and that it has an application to them. They were the first. They were the nation of God. But what Jesus is saying, if you reject me, it's very much like what the Bible says in Hebrews 6. Even though people had been part of the nation of Israel, if they rejected Christ and tried to cling to the old covenant, he was saying that's not going to work. God has moved on. He has revealed his new revelation in Christ, and he's basically giving a warning. There is no other way. People balk at this. People have the idea, they, they cry out, it's not fair of God to be so narrow-minded. Jesus said, it is a narrow way. And when I talk about reaching out to God and reaching out to people, there's a warning here because there's a lot of people who feel that they're reaching out to God just because they're spiritual people. Where, where I get told all the time, I'm a very spiritual person. I'm a very spiritual person. And a lot of people, just because they commune with nature or because they realize that there's a spiritual world and they believe, they, they think that I'm connected to spiritual things. There is one way. That one way is Jesus. That one way is Jesus. Jesus is saying, man, what is his need? Repent or die. What is God doing? He's giving us time to repent. And the thing is, if you go God's way, it is the way of healing and freedom. And it is a kingdom that is meant to spread. But in the very spreading of the kingdom, sometimes people start to get a little bit loose in the sense of, let's just involve everybody. Let's just include everybody. And the fact is, Jesus says, there is no other way apart from Christ. He is the only way. And then go on to verse 31. And because he is the only way, Jesus says this. Just at that time, some Pharisees approached, saying to him, Go away, leave here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Understand, he has just so spoken about there being a narrow way. Who is the narrow way? It's him. It is Jesus. Jesus knows his mission to become the, the Savior of the world to enact salvation and make it possible through the cross. And he says, go and tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow and the third day I reach my goal. Nevertheless, I must journey on today and tomorrow and the next day, for it cannot be that a prophet will perish outside of Jerusalem. What is Jesus saying? What is this whole third day business? I mean, every time you see third day, can you just tell me what it's a reference to? It is a reference to the resurrection. When he says today and tomorrow and the next day, it, once again, you've got three days. You've got a reference to the fact that Jesus knows his mission and he's going to see it through. Nobody's going to stop him. Nobody's going to stop him. I want to add to the, set, the next point. Jesus says in point number five, there is no other way and he knew this was something that was not only true for human beings, it was something that was true for him. He had a mission to accomplish. And what I want you to see is that Jesus was saying, it does not matter where the opposition comes from. I will accomplish my mission. Why did he do that? 
What was motivating him? I asked you a similar question last week. Jesus, according to the book of Hebrews, said for the joy that was set before him, he endured the shame and the pain of the cross. What was the joy? We're the joy. We're the joy. The only thing that Jesus had after the cross and the resurrection that he didn't have before the cross and the resurrection was us. I want you to understand something and we need to appreciate something in this big picture of what's going on in the world. See, you and I were in the condition of repent or die. And God has given us time to repent. And because of Christ, we have been given healing and freedom. And because of that, we have the opportunity to reach out and allow the kingdom of God to spread through us. But we must be certain and understand there is no other way for salvation other than Christ alone. And we also need to embrace and understand and perceive His tremendous commitment for us. If I could go and spend all the time needed to describe this pain and the sorrow and the agony of the cross, all of that, even though he struggled the night before he went to the cross, he, if there was any other way, he wanted to be able to go that way, but he knew there wasn't, and so he was committed to fulfill it. Why? For us. For us. God is giving us a picture here in this chapter. And what we see is Jesus' commitment to fulfill His mission to be our Savior. And His commitment was total. His commitment was total. When He stood face to face with Satan, Satan realized, I can't stop Him. When He stood face to face with Herod in this passage, He's saying, even though Herod was the representative of the greatest human power that had ever come on the earth, Herod was appointed by the Roman Empire. And we've talked about how God has worked throughout Scripture, putting his man right next to the, the leading power in the world at that time. Herod represented the greatest power that humanity had ever seen. And even though it stood against Jesus, Jesus said, you can't stop me. And when he stood against his own agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, it won't stop me. And when he stood before Pilate, he said, it will not stop me. And when he stood before the crowds who had cried Hosanna before him a week, less than a week before, and they said, crucify him, he said, it will not stop me. I will fulfill my mission. And that commitment was commitment to you. And it's a commitment that when we stop and consider our relationship with Christ today, that's a commitment that continues. He is committed to you as your Savior. And I want you to look at these last verses, verses 34 and 35. Consider for just a moment verse 33. He said, it cannot be that a prophet would perish outside Jerusalem. He knew that he had to go to Jerusalem. By the way, if, as we read this, we're going to continue. As Jesus keeps saying, I'm going to Jerusalem, he was warned over and over, don't go to Jerusalem, they're going to kill you. And that's the point. That's the point. I'm going to, I'm going to see it through. I'm going to Jerusalem. And so in other words, he was saying, I'm going to fulfill this mission. But then look, as he mentions Jerusalem, his own thoughts, his own words, bring, bring out. Have you ever said something and just the very saying of it, your voice kind of broke and you started to tear up. I don't know if Jesus did right here. I kind of imagine that he did. Every once in a while you'll talk to somebody and, and just saying something. Maybe, maybe saying the name of a loved one that has died or something. I, I talk to people all the time and, and you encourage them and you talk to them. They've recently lost someone. But then they just say something that, that touches a nerve and they just... Kind of break up for just a moment. Jesus is talking about his commitment. And he said that I've got to die in Jerusalem, basically, is what he's saying. But then that very thought stirs in him something that I believe reveals his heart. And so the last point that I want you to consider is God's heart. 
All of these things that, that I've shared with you, there's a flow of thought here. And what I want you to see is God's heart. Every person's condition is repent or die. And what is God doing? He's giving us more time. And if we repent and go His way, it's the way of healing and freedom. And it grows as we connect with Him and connect with people. And there is no other way. But thank God Jesus was totally committed to His mission. And in the midst of all of this, in the whole process of man and God's relationship, God's heart is revealed in these next few verses. Oh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. Now understand, if you're not familiar with the Bible, Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. And Israel had been the people through whom God had been working His plan. And His desire from the very beginning was to draw us to a relationship with Him. But in the very city, and that was the, the capital city of His people to whom He had revealed Himself, they killed the prophets and they stoned those who were sent to preach God's Word to her. And look at God's heart. In the midst of that, in the midst of the rejection, He says, how often I wanted to gather your children together just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. And you would not have it. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. And I say to you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There are other things that we could address in this passage, but I want you to just note one thing. I want you to note one thing. What is God's heart? God's heart is inviting God's heart is inviting. Inviting. He's saying, come to me. You know, this is why we say, come to Jesus. You know, come to Jesus. I, something that's become very popular, and I hear it from people who don't have a clue what it means. All of a sudden, it's become popular to say, oh, we have a come to Jesus moment. Have you heard that? I mean, people will say, yeah, we have a come to Jesus meeting. And it just means we're getting serious and we're talking. You know what? Satan is trying to make us take that and make it just something that we're so com commonly used to that we don't understand the meaning of it. The meaning of come to Jesus is to realize your condition, repent or die. Is to realize He's the only way. Is to come to Him and realize that you are my only hope. And Jesus was totally committed on our behalf and God's heart is opening His arms and saying, Come to me. Come to Jesus. Jesus said, Come to me, you who are weary and who are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Come to me and I'll heal you. Come to me and I'll set you free. Come to me. And as we consider all of these things, God's heart, I, I thought of different words. I could, have, I could have used the word, God's heart is open. God's heart is loving. God's heart is compassionate. His desire is that we come to Him. And it's not just His desire that we come to Him for salvation. Every day, every moment, we talk about how the kingdom grows. He wants us to come to Him through intimate contact every day. And so as we consider these things, I want you to just consider. Have you repented? Have you repented? Now let me ask you, what are you doing with your time? Are you bearing fruit? Are you bearing fruit? Are you living the health and freedom of your salvation? Are you connected to God and connecting to people so that the kingdom can grow through you? Do you understand and communicate that Jesus is the one way? Do you fully appreciate Christ's commitment to you? Do you fully appreciate God's heart? I was thinking of this, and it just doesn't sound right to say Jesus is like a chicken. It doesn't. That just doesn't seem right. But do you understand that Jesus said this? And as I often do for these sermons, I, I search for some pictures on the internet. And I want you to just put this up for a second. Is 
Does that stir any feelings in your heart? Because Jesus said, Jesus said this, I gather you like a hen gathers her chicks. There are several places in the Bible where it says that God stretches out his wings over us. Go to the next picture. I just looked at several of these pictures. Because this is Jesus' picture. Go to the next one. Jesus said, this is what it's like. I, I gather you. If you just come to me, I gather you. Go to the next picture. Look at all those legs. <laughs> Look at all those legs. I, I mean, I could, I could preach a sermon just on that because we're, if we spend time in intimate fellowship with him, people look at us and they see him. I mean, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go, go tell your friends. Our pastor says Jesus is like a chicken. Jesus said he's like a hand that wants to gather us. Look at this picture. I, I mean, they're just crawling all over. They just want to be close. Look at the next picture. They're just in there. The next one. <laughs> I love that picture. I'm going to just stop right there. Do you see the warmth? Do you see the protection? Do you see the peace? Do you see the invitation? This is the whole picture. I want you to bow your heads. You like the deacons to come. Jesus gave us another picture. He says, come to the table. Over and over in the scripture, he just keeps saying, come. Come. Huh. Everything that we've talked about really is seen in this table.